Hey again, scientists. Welcome back for Lesson 5 of Natural Selection with me, Ms. Shetha, coming at you again from Seattle, Washington. Here's what you'll need for this lesson. A pencil or a pen, some line or blank paper, an optional but highly encouraged, a family member, friend, or a pet that you can check in with, a computer logged in to Amplify, and if you have one, a Lesson 5 packet that you receive from your teacher. All right, let's have everyone get those minds working and let's warm up with this little exercise here. Here's what I would like you to do. Turn and talk to a friend or a family member or jot your responses down on a piece of paper about the following questions ref which refer to this diagram right here. What do you notice about the traits of the offspring compared to the parents? Now, first thing I want you to notice on this diagram, it's set up kind of like a family tree. So on the top of the diagram here, we have parents, and at the bottom here, we have offspring, okay? So parents and offspring. And this question is asking you to compare the traits of the offspring compared to the traits of the parents. So what do you notice there? Second question, where do organisms get their traits? Start thinking about this. We kind of um, understood a little bit about this with our reading about jellyfish from the last lesson. So think about how would you answer this question? Where do organisms get their traits? Pause the video, grab someone near you, text a friend, Snapchat them, whatever you'd like to do, and think about this diagram and these two questions. When we have someone to talk to, we can really process a little bit more about what's going on. So pause the video now. Go ahead, do it. Okay, so I'm going to share with you now um, some of the things I notice about this diagram and reference these two questions that we are thinking about as we start this lesson, okay? So uh, first thing I notice, parent one here, his name is Otis, and he has a brown body. He's got some purple stripes on his abdomen, which is the back part of his body, and he's got these hairs coming off of his legs. Um, and the hairs are there, um, but comparatively, Anne has got a lot more hairs on her legs, and Anne's body is white. I can see that she has a black set of stripes on her abdomen. And so I noticed that these two parent spiders, Otis and Anne, um, are very different in the way that they appear. And I, that makes me think about how their traits for things like their body color and their stripe color and their um, hairs on their legs are pretty different. Um, so this makes me wonder about like, oh, wow, I wonder like their offspring are probably going to be interesting too. So taking a look at their offspring, I see there's one, two, three offspring spiders that have white bodies, kind of like Anne, and then one offspring spider that has a brown body like Otis. Now, in terms of stripe color, this is very interesting. There's all sorts of combinations going on here from what I notice. In terms of stripe color, I see here that there's one, two, three. These two, these three offspring spiders have um, black stripes on their abdomen. And this is a really unique combination because we have the black on top of the brown, which we did not see in this in the parents, which is super interesting. And then we have one spider that does have that purple stripe color like Otis does. But this is interesting too. The offspring spider, that's okay, that's interesting. It has um a purple stripe color on the white body, which we also did not see before in the two parent spiders. Um, okay, let me let me think about this uh, the hair on their um, legs as well. So you can see there's lots of variation in the hairs. Um, none of them have as many as Anne, um, but a lot of them have more hair on their legs than Otis does. So that's really interesting to me. So I'm beginning to wonder like, what, how did this happen? There's lots of different combinations going on here. I, wanna, I definitely wanna know more about that. 
Now, in terms of the second question, where do organisms get their traits? Well, I remember from the reading, there was something about genes, there was something about proteins, and those two seem to be connected in the way these traits like body color or stripe color or um, hair on the legs is expressed. So I think there's something going on there, that connection between genes, proteins, and traits, but I can't remember exactly. Well, we're going to dive in more of that, and we're going to use spiders as our, our uh, subject, so to speak, to understand a little bit more about the connection between those three things, like we began talking about last lesson with those jellyfish. All right, everyone, so what we're going to do now is we are going to go into a simulation that's actually not the natural selection simulation, and what it will allow us to do is be able to zoom in into that molecular scale and be able to see that connection between genes, proteins, and traits. Now in the simulation, you will see a spider population, and some of you may actually remember the simulation from another unit that you've done previously. In this simulation, we'll be focusing on the feature of stripe color for this population of spiders. Now here are the two spiders we're particularly going to be concerned with. The first is Otis, and Otis has a brown body and blue stripe color on his um, abdomen, which is the back part of his body. The other spider we're going to be particularly concerned about is Ruby here, and Ruby has a yellow body with black stripes on her abdomen. All right, everyone, so here we are in this different simulation, and we have Otis here. As we mentioned before, Otis has a brown body with blue stripes on his abdomen. Now, there's lots, I can see a lot of moving parts here, and there's lots of different things happening. So let's make sure that we have a couple of the essentials down here as we are looking to understand at the molecular scale what is going on that allows for these traits to be expressed. And particularly in this simulation, what we're thinking about is how is this trait for blue stripe color be able to be expressed? The first thing I want you to notice are Otis's genes. In this right-hand corner in the box, we can see Otis's chromosomes. Now, remember, chromosomes are those bundles of tightly wound DNA, and that's where the genes are located, on an organism's chromosomes. If we look at Otis's genes, we can see he has two T2 genes on this set of chromosomes. So he has a T2 and a T2. Now, remember, those genes provide instructions for making proteins. Well, let's take a look at which proteins Otis has. So these T2, T2 genes provide instructions for making the number two protein. I can see that in his cell that um, those T2 proteins, those protein number twos, are floating around and they kind of look like a rectangle with a rounded edge, okay? A rectangle with a rounded edge. Now, I want you to notice something else here as well. Right now, this two protein, number two protein, is connected like a lock and key with another molecule. We can see that going on here as well. Now, let's take a look at what's happening and how that lock and key kind of model allows for the expression of the blue pigment that is in Otis's stripe color on his abdomen. Okay, so what we know is that Otis has these T2 gene versions, which we can see here, and those provide instructions for the number two protein right here. Now, I'm going to zoom in a little bit further, and what's important to note here is that as that those genes are providing instructions to make the protein in a very particular shape. And that particular shape allows for the protein to be able to fit in a uh, another molecule. And when that protein fits into that molecule, that allows for the expression of 
for example here, the blue pigment. So it's kind of like that lock and key that I mentioned before. The genes provide instructions for the proteins to make this particular shape that fits together with a larger molecule. And when that fit happens, then it unlocks a blue pigment to be produced, which is what gives Otis that blue stripe color on the back of his abdomen. Okay, so now I remember we were concerned about Ruby too. Now remember, Ruby was a spider that had a yellow body color with black stripes on her abdomen. So I'm now wondering, how are the genes and proteins different between Otis and Ruby that's causing Ruby to have black on her abdomen while Otis had blue. So let's take a look here. Again, lots of moving parts. So let's make sure we walk through this together to see what's happening and why these differences in stripe color are occurring. First, let's take a look at Ruby's genes. Her gene versions, again, these are her chromosomes, those tightly wound bundles of DNA, and her genes are on those chromosomes. Now, Ruby has T2 and T3 gene versions on her chromosomes. So what does that mean? Again, those genes are providing instructions for proteins. So what I think this shows here is that Ruby is able to make the number two protein and the number three protein, which is different than what I just showed you with Otis. So we have these T2, T3 gene versions, which allow for the number two and number three protein to be created in um, Ruby's cells. We can see that here in her cell, we've got this number two protein floating around, and we have these number three proteins floating around. Now the number two protein, like I mentioned before, is kind of like a rectangle with one rounded edge, but this number three protein is kind of like a like a crown. It has two pointy edges um, on it. And so we can see here that Ruby has both the number two and number three protein, and that's because her genes are providing the instructions for those two proteins to be made. Now, let's zoom in and see how this works in terms of shape and that lock and key model that we talked about earlier. Okay, so just like before, we can see our number two protein fitting in with a larger molecule, and that therefore is producing the blue pigment. Let's see that right here. Right here, we can see that number two protein connecting with the larger molecule, and that is producing this blue pigment. Now, on the other hand, we also have that number three protein because we have the the T3 gene. And we can see here that that number three protein is also connecting with those larger molecules to be able to produce this black pigment. So we have both the number two and number three proteins connecting with larger molecules to create that blue or that black pigment respectively. Now here's a question. I am wondering what might happen if I changed one of Ruby's gene versions so that it would replicate Otis's uh, feature for stripe color. What do you think would happen if I changed Ruby's T3 gene to T2? Pause the video and I want you to turn and talk to someone and predict what do you think might happen if I changed Ruby's T3 gene version to T2. Pause the video, talk about it, and then I'll be right back with you. Okay, so I hope you made a prediction and um, hopefully that was based in this understanding that genes provide instructions for proteins, okay? So we're going to change Ruby's gene, uh, T3 gene, we're gonna change that to a T2. And I want you to see what happens here, okay? When we changed 
Ruby's gene version from T3 to T2. Now, all that she is making is that T is that number two protein, and therefore her stripe color has now changed to blue. What is happening here is that the change in that gene version changes the protein and that structure of the protein that can fit into the larger molecule, and thus only the blue pigment can now be produced. So changing that gene version changes the protein and the structure of the protein that's created, which changes what that protein can fit into, and thus changes the pigment color, which Ruby, uh, which then changes the, the stripe color that Ruby has, which is now blue instead of black. All right, so let's take all of this into consideration and do some sense making. There's a lot going on here and we need to make sense out of it. So grab someone that's near you, text a friend that's also watching this video with you, and let's make sense of everything that we just saw because that was a lot going on. So what we can understand from what we just saw is that genes m provide instructions for making proteins. And these proteins have particular shapes. So the genes also dictate what shape that protein is. Those proteins are then, the way they fit together with the larger molecules, allow for traits to be expressed, okay? This is what we call a central dogma or central concept of genetics in biology. Genes provide instructions for proteins, which are then expressed as traits. And remember that shape of the protein is particularly important because it's got to be able to fit with that larger molecule in order for, in our case, a pigment to be produced for the stripe color of the spider. And we can see that here with the different gene version that Ruby had. Um, those gene versions, that difference provided different instructions, which was a different shape protein, which fitted differently with the molecule that created the black protein, okay? So a lot going on here. Remember, genes provide instructions for proteins, which are then expressed as traits. Okay, so let's boil this down to a couple of key concepts that are fundamental to our understanding and will help us explain um, the phenomena of the newts that we have been investigating as well. Grab your pencil. You're going to need to write this down. You can write it down in a tracker if you're using one of those. I'm just using a little notebook. You can put it down in your notebook. It's going to be essential that you write this down to help further our understanding. Okay, so the first key concept, genes are instructions for making protein molecules and protein molecules determine an organism's traits. Second key concept, individuals inherit their genes from their parents. Genes and therefore traits in a population are passed down from generation to generation. We're going to see that a little bit more with our next activity, but make sure you have these written down either in your tracker or your notebook so we can expand upon them a little bit later. So now we have a better understanding of where individuals in population get their traits. We know that they get their traits from their genes, and those genes come from the parents of a organism who have passed down their genes through the process of reproduction. Now those genes then provide instructions for making proteins in a particular shape, and those proteins can then attach to larger molecules, which then allow for a particular trait, such as stripe color in the spiders we saw before, to be expressed, okay? So now the question becomes, well then how do some traits become more common in a population? And we know that the new population became more poisonous because of the presence of snakes in the environment, which caused the trait for poison level to become an adaptive trait. 
but how did it become more common in the population is our next question. Now, our park visitors have some suggestions for us on how exactly this happened. The first suggestion that they have is that poison level 10 is the most common in the population because the newts with this trait were able to live longer than other newts. Their next suggestion is that poison level 10 is the most common because the newts with the trait produce more than other newts. So let's check this out in our simulation and find out um, some evidence and data that may support or refute either of these claims. So as we go into our simulation, we're going to be investigating this question. How do some traits become more common over many generations while others become less common? Now, grab your pencil or pen and we need to create a data table in your notebook for you to record this data. Here is what your data table should look like. So with your pen or pencil, and your notebook, you can grab a ruler if you want to be particular about it. You are going to create this table in which we will be recording data for each of these different um, ostrilopes with different color levels of one, four, seven, and 10. And we'll have five different trials here. And what we're gonna do is we are going to follow ostrilopes with this particular color, and we're gonna count how many times they reproduce while we're watching the simulation. And that will give us some evidence as to uh, which uh, ostrilope colors may reproduce more or less than others. So go ahead, take a minute with your pen or pencil, and copy down this data table so that we will um, have a space to record our data. Here we are in our natural selection simulation. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this hamburger menu up here. And if you're following along on Amplify on your computer or other device, you can do this as well. So I simply went to Amplify, clicked on the natural selection simulation. And where I'm gonna go is go to our reproduction claims in the hamburger menu there. I'm gonna load those reproduction claims. And I'm gonna go ahead and get set up with our first trial and in our first trial I'm going to start with blue number one so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to zoom in over here and I'm going to look for an ostrilope that has a blue number one color level so here is one right here and then when I run the simulation I can go a little bit closer so I can follow my blue number one ostrilope and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the simulation and count how many times my ostrilope with a color level of one um, reproduces. So I'm going to go ahead and run it and we're, we'll count together how many times this ostrilope is able to reproduce. Now, if this ostrilope gets eaten before reproducing, he'll just get a, um, a number zero in our data table. So let's go ahead and watch and see how many times this ostrilope reproduces. All right, I see this ostrilope is reproducing once. And then, unfortunately, he got eaten. So I'm going to take my pen or my pencil, and in my data table that I just drew in my notebook here, I'm going to write down a 1 for trial 1 blue. 1. All right, we just did trial 1 blue 1. Now we are going to zoom in again. I've reset my simulation, and I'm going to look now for an ostrilope that has blue number 4 a blue number four color. So that leads me to believe it'll be kind of bluish green. So let me see if we can find one. There's a three, here's a four, fantastic. So I'm gonna run the simulation and again, we're gonna count how many times the ostrilope with blue number four color-wise uh, reproduces. So let's go ahead and count how many times this ostrilope reproduces.
Our astrolope is just eating at the moment. Oh, he's found, finding a mate. So that's once. That's twice. That's three times it's reproduced. And then he gets eaten. So I'm going to document that with my pencil on my data table right here. Trial one blue number four is uh, reproduced three times. So make sure you have that in your data table as well. All right, so I've reset my simulation now, and now I'm gonna be looking for a yellow number seven Australope. So let me zoom in here, and I wanna find a yellow number seven, that's a number eight. So let's find a yellow seven, that's a nine. There we go, here's a yellow number seven Australope. And again, what we're gonna do is when I run it, we'll count how many times this particular Australope reproduces. Oh, looks like he's found a mate. Okay, so this is number one time it reproduces. Notice how the carnathons are just kind of passing it by. Here's the second time it's reproducing. Third time it's reproducing and then it has gotten eaten. So I'm gonna pause the simulation right down there and I'm gonna go ahead and write down this Australope yellow number seven also reproduced three times before it was eaten. And that's again, trial number one, yellow seven, it reproduced three times. All right, so I reset my simulation again and now I'm looking for an Australope with a yellow color 10, a yellow color 10. And so I feel like this one might be one. Oh, that's close. It's a, a yellow number nine. Let's see if I can find a yellow 10. That's a seven, which we just did. Yellow 10, maybe one of these. Oh, clicked on the wrong one. That's a nine. That's a nine. Here's a 10, fantastic. So I'm gonna zoom in and here's our friendly little Australope level 10 color. And I'm gonna run the simulation and again, we're gonna count how many times this particular Australope reproduces. Okay, unfortunately that one got eaten really quickly. So I'm just gonna mark that down as a zero on my data table. So I've taken my pencil and I've written down zero. Um, where it says trial one, yellow 10, okay? Now, that's only one trial, right? We need more evidence and more data so that we can make a further conclusion about the population as a whole. So we're gonna do uh, trials two, three, four, and five as well. Um, same thing, we'll look at the Australope color that's designated and we'll count how many times it reproduces. All right, we are in trial two, folks, and I'm looking for blue Australope um, with a color level of one, and we are gonna zoom in and go ahead and count how many times this Australope reproduces for trial two. Let's go ahead and watch. And it got eaten right away before it could even reproduce. So I'm gonna mark that down as a zero. Let's go um, ahead and reset and go straight into a Australope with blue number four. Let's go ahead and find one if we can. There we go. Here's a blue level four Australope. And let's how, count how many times it reproduces as well. Okay, that's once that it reproduces. and then unfortunately got eaten. So um, for blue, Australope blue four, for trial two, that was only a one. Gonna go ahead and reset, and let's find an Australope with a yellow color seven. 
fantastic. And we'll zoom in a little bit further so we can see. And we'll run it and count how many times it reproduces. So that's once, that's twice, Notice how some of the carnathons are just passing it by. That's three times. That's four times. Five times. Six times. Seven times. This Australopithecus camouflaged very well. So we're at seven times so far. Taking a little bit of patience and waiting. and then it has gotten eaten after seven times of reproducing. So for trial two, this ostrilope with yellow color seven reproduced seven times. And let's do our last one for trial number two, folks. This is a yellow color 10 ostrilope. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in and find a yellow color 10. That one was a nine. Make sure I reset. Here is a yellow 10. So we're going to follow this ostrilope and see how many times it reproduces. Okay, unfortunately that one got eaten right away. So I'm going to document that on my data table as a uh, zero for the amount of reproduction it did. Um, we're going to go ahead and reset and let's move on to trial number three now as well.